Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. In the early morning hours of July 16, 1945, the first ever atomic bomb was detonated in the New Mexico desert, ushering in the nuclear age. Today, we explore the remarkable story of Robert Oppenheimer and his pivotal role in the Manhattan Project, which led to the breakthrough of the gadget atomic bomb. You are the man who gave them the power to destroy themselves. And the world is not prepared. We'll also dive into the correlation between Oppenheimer's bomb and the Cold War missiles such as the Atlas F, Titan 1, and Titan 2s, and how the scientific progress sparked the space race. Welcome to Nuclear Bunker Living. Robert Oppenheimer's gadget bomb refers to the first successful test of a nuclear weapon, codenamed Trinity, which took place on July 16, 1945, in New Mexico. Oppenheimer, a prominent physicist, was the scientific director of the Manhattan Project, a secret research program during World War II aimed at the development of atomic weapons. What were you guys doing in Los Alamos? Detonator charge! The explosion released an astonishing amount of energy equivalent to 25 kilotons of TNT. The success of the Trinity test meant that the United States would be able to use atomic weapons in warfare, which they did twice less than a month later. Would the Japanese surrender if they knew what was coming? The gadget bomb's success marked the end of World War II with the dropping of Little Man and Fat Boy on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which then sparked the beginning of nuclear arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. The all-shattering devastation in which was born the atomic age. In its birth pangs, 75,000 people were killed, 70,000 injured. The bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, which followed the Trinity test, resulted in immense human suffering and raised awareness about the catastrophic effects of nuclear weapons. This led to the emergence of anti-nuclear movements and calls for disarmament, which continue to influence public opinion and policy debates even today. After the bombings of both Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the immediate action for the Russians and the United States was a massive race towards nuclear supremacy. Over the next 15 years, both sides tested many nuclear detonations to see who could build the biggest and most destructive super bomb. The Russians have a bomb. We're supposed to be years ahead of them, but... Between 1945 and 1960 alone, the United States of America and the USSR detonated and tested over 300 nuclear bombs. From 1945 to 2017, there has been at least eight nations that have detonated over 2,000 nuclear tests. A large number of early tests, roughly over 500, were detonated as atmospheric bursts, which spread radioactive material through the atmosphere. The 1963 Limited Test Ban Treaty brought about the end of most, but not all, nuclear test explosions in the atmosphere. However, many underground nuclear blasts have also vented radioactive material into the atmosphere and left radioactive contamination in the soil. This science was cutting edge and was pushed to the farthest extent in the culmination of the Soviet Union dropping the biggest bomb to ever be detonated in 1961, the Tsar Bomb. is the terror that once again casts its eerie shadow over the face of the earth. The hydrogen bomb, the bomb that Khrushchev announces will once again undergo tests by the Russians. As nuclear tests ban talks reconvened in Geneva, the Soviets said that they would resume testing and hinted at a new, even more horrible weapon. The move was denounced heatedly by the West and neutralist nations. As tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States became more volatile, both sides set out to utilize the sciences that created Oppenheimer's bomb and applied it to three staged unmanned rockets such as the Atlas F, Titan Ones, and the Titan Twos to carry a massive nuclear payload to the opposing country from thousands of miles away. 
the development of the intercontinental ballistic missile, which we mainly cover on our channel, were capable of delivering nuclear warheads over long distances further transformed the nature of warfare, emphasizing the importance of missile defense systems and strategic deterrence through what was known as MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. The Titan family of rockets, specifically the Titan II that was operational during the Cold War, did play a crucial role in the moon landings. The Titan II was a modified version of the Titan I missile repurposed for space exploration. It was used as a launch vehicle for the Gemini projects, which aimed to develop the necessary technology and techniques for manned spaceflight. The Gemini program, conducted by NASA from 1961 to 1966, involved a series of missions that included spacewalks, rendezvous and docking maneuvers, and long-duration flights. The Titan II rocket was responsible for launching the Gemini spacecraft into orbit, allowing astronauts to practice and refine the skills needed for the subsequent Apollo missions which aimed to land humans on the moon. The Titan II rocket successfully launched all 10 manned Gemini missions, including the historic Gemini 4 mission in 1965 during which astronaut Ed White became the first American to perform a spacewalk. I think I'm dragging a little bit, so I don't want to fire the gun yet. Okay, I'm out. Okay, you're out. You're close to free. Okay, I put a little roll in, took it right out. Am I in your view, Jimbo? Yeah, you know, I can't. Okay, I rolled off, I'm rolling to the right now. It's under my own influence. There goes this. Looks like a thermal glove, Jim. It is, man. With the triumphs of Edward White's first spacewalk for the United States came with tragedy soon thereafter. The Apollo 1 mission was intended to be the first manned mission of NASA's Apollo program. However, it tragically ended in disaster before the spacecraft even launched. On January 27, 1967, during a pre-launch test on the launch pad at Cape Kennedy, a fire broke out inside the Apollo 1 command module, resulting in the deaths of all three crew members, Gus Grissom, Edward White, and Robert Chaffee. The fire occurred during a plugs out test, which simulated conditions of a countdown without the spacecraft being fueled. The astronauts were inside the command module, which was pressurized with pure oxygen. The exact cause of the fire was determined to be an electrical spark that ignited the highly flammable materials inside the module, including the nylon netting and Velcro used for equipment storage. The fire spread rapidly and the crew was unable to open the hatch due to the design of the module. The intense heat and smoke caused the deaths of the astronauts within seconds. The tragedy exposed significant design flaws and safety issues with the Apollo spacecraft, leading to a thorough investigation and subsequent redesign of the command module. The Apollo 1 disaster had a profound impact on the Apollo program. It resulted in a 20-month hiatus in crewed Apollo missions, during which extensive safety improvements were made to the spacecraft. The tragedy also led to the changes in the culture and procedures at NASA, emphasizing safety and crew protection. The sacrifice of the Apollo 1 crew members played a crucial role in improving the safety and reliability of the Apollo spacecraft, ultimately leading to the successful lunar missions that followed. Fast forward to July of 1969. The Apollo 11 mission was the culmination of NASA's Apollo program, which aimed to land humans on the moon. The mission launched on July 16, 1969 from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The crew consisted of Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins. On July 20th, 1969, the lunar module named Eagle separated from the command module carrying Armstrong and Aldrin. The lunar module approached the moon's surface and Armstrong skillfully piloted the spacecraft to a safe landing site. Armstrong radioed the famous words, The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. Several hours later, Armstrong descended the ladder of the lunar module and became the first human to set foot on the moon. He uttered the iconic phrase, That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Aldrin joined him shortly after, and together they conducted experiments, collected samples, and planted the American flag. During their 
After approximately two and a half hours on the lunar surface, Armstrong and Aldrin conducted various tasks. They deployed scientific instruments, took photographs, collected rock and soil samples, and set up experiments to measure the moon's seismic activity and other scientific data. The moon landing of Apollo 11 was a monumental achievement in human history, representing the culmination of years of scientific research, technological advancements, and the dedication of countless individuals on both sides. It expanded our understanding of the universe, inspired future space exploration, and remains a symbol of human ingenuity and exploration. So with all that being said, why do we bring up Oppenheimer and his legacy? It is one of the main reasons why our channel even exists. The masterful physics behind Oppenheimer's gadget bomb played a pivotal role in shaping the future of warfare, as well as the scientific and technological advancements that led to the space race and ultimately the moon landing. This contribution has far more reaching effects than most would like to talk about, and its successful detonation not only demonstrated the destructive power of nuclear weapons, which we feature on our channel, but also propelled nations to invest in missile technology, leading to significant developments in space exploration and the conquest of the moon. But, with nuclear rattling back at the forefront, who's to say what happens next?